Ok. Buen día. Voy a empezar la charla. Um, soy Carlos Domingo. Antes de empezar, uh, ¿puedo hacer la charla en español o en inglés, no en portugués? <ríe> ¿Qué preferís? ¿Español? ¿Inglés? Ok. English won, so I'll do it in English. Ok. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give a talk about the, the web. Um, I'm currently the, the president of uh, Telefonica R&D, is the research and development arm of the Telefonica, which is the parent company of uh, Vivo here in Brazil. Uh, but at the same time, I contribute with the Mozilla Foundation, as you can see, uh, in the project uh, Firefox OS to bring Firefox to mobile phones. So what I'm going to tell you here is a little bit of the story of how Firefox OS was created and tell you also uh, why I think it's a very important project and what have we have been doing during 2013 together with the Mozilla Foundation. So the title uh, of the conference is called The Web is Dead, uh, Long Live the Web. And the reason the, the title is called The Web is Dead is because in 2010, um, can you guys lower the, the lights? Because it hits there. If you can lower the lights. Can you see well? Okay, good. So, so this, this is a cover that uh, Wire Magazine, uh, is a, Wire Magazine is a very famous technology magazine. Uh, his uh, editor back then was Chris Anderson, and Chris Anderson um, published a cover uh, in his magazine in July 2010 saying that the web is dead, and he wanted to explain why he thought the web was dead. And this is his argument. He had this uh, insight in the article saying that if you look at the traffic uh, on the internet, the, since 1990 when the web started, uh, then the, the web traffic grow and grow and grow and grow, but since 2000, the traffic of the web have been decreasing uh, because other traffics on the internet were overtaking the percentage of uh, web uh, traffic. Keep in mind, this is percentage. It's no absolute number. Okay, So this is a, an important thing. But there was another reason why he thought the web uh, was going to be dead. And th the reason was the following. That since 2008, uh, when more or less smartphones started to come, so to th iPhone uh, was released in 2007, and then Android was released in 2008, 2009, then the traffic of mobile have been increasing a lot. And this is from a year ago, uh, but if you look at the numbers now, it's actually continue growing. So traffic in mobile is growing a lot compared to, to traffic on, the, on desktops, on, on PCs. And um, so for some companies like Facebook, uh, now mobile is more important than, than desktop. In fact, I, I know Facebook quite well, so I visit them regularly. And uh, a couple of years ago, Facebook created a mobile team. And they had a VP of mobile. They have a, a development for mobile. Now there's no mobile in Facebook because everything is mobile. So mobile is their main focus. And if you can see the numbers here, then the Facebook uh, mobile traffic is actually bigger than the non-mobile traffic and is growing uh, much faster. So Facebook is actually a mobile company, even though most people don't think of Facebook as a mobile company. And this is because smartphones, as you know, have been uh, you know, growing and growing and growing and growing. And people use smartphones not as a phone, but they use as a as a mobile device to access the internet. And then, therefore, a lot of people is accessing uh, the internet from, uh, from mobile phones. This is just numbers from the countries with top, uh, the highest penetration in the world. In some cases, you look like uh, you know, South Korea or the Emirates, almost 80% of the population uses a smartphone instead of using a, uh, another type of phone. And in mobile, we have a situation which is very different than on PC because there's two main operating systems. One is iOS from Apple. Uh, that is what you have on the iPhone. How many people have an iPhone here? And the other one is Android. Uh, so how many people have Android here? OK, more or less the percentage is similar. 15% people iPhone and 85% uh, uh, Android. And this is the situation. Most people are using iOS or Android. Is someone here not using iOS or Android on, on their smartphone? OK, Firefox OS, no? <laughs> so uh, you'll see uh, why this is a problem. So this is similar situation that what we had uh, back then when we had uh, the web as a platform, and then people use PCs. And on PC, it, it didn't matter what operating system we're using, because people were accessing uh, uh, applications from a browser. And there were many browsers to choose from. They had Internet Explorer, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, on mobile, you have three platforms, and all of them are proprietary, it's incompatible. So when I access the web on a PC, it doesn't matter which browser I'm using, I get the same experience and I get the same content. Well, if you are on mobile and if you have iOS or Android or Windows Phone, is anyone using Windows Phone here? 
Okay, so you, you have another proprietary platform. So something that is accessible in Windows Phone is not necessarily accessible in iOS or on Android, and the experience uh, is very different. <coughs> so these companies, the companies that play on mobile, are very different companies or, or act very differently because they're basically trying to control the whole ecosystem. They're trying to control the hardware. They're trying to control the operating system. The ecosystem of apps, they tell you what things you can install and which not, because the only way to install things is through the, the official application store. And of course, the browser, because the browser you get on Windows Phone is different than the browser you get uh, on iOS. And for instance, Firefox Mobile doesn't work in iOS because Apple prohibits Firefox from running uh, in iOS. So they try to control the, the browser because they know it's the access to, to content. So. And people on mobile use things very, very differently than they use on the PC. On the PC, the main platform for accessing content is the web and the browser. Like 90% of people will use the browser for accessing content. On mobile, uh, on the other hand, people are using apps, mainly uh, you know, downloaded from the official application stores. And then these apps is the primary way of accessing content on mobile. It's so extreme that if you see in this graphic, apps is like 87% of what people do on mobiles while the web is very small, it's 27% and it's actually declining. This is the opposite situation as in PC. In PC, the web is the main way of accessing uh, content and uh, on mobile is apps. So why this is a problem and why this is something we need to try to change if we want to have freedom on mobile? Well, basically, um, the apps are uh, built there and they are uh, in an ecosystem that the companies that <coughs> manufacture the operating system and the hardware, they're trying to protect their business. Basically, Apple doesn't want you, if you have an iPhone, to switch to an Android. And therefore, they lock everything you can do on the, on the iPhone that only works on iPhone. So if you want to switch to Android, and I switch devices all the time, uh, it's very complicated because there's no simple way of carrying your content and moving it from one place or another. And that way, you know, your tendency will be to buy the new uh, iPhone rather than buy uh, you know, a Samsung Galaxy or whatever other uh, operating uh, hardware. And they, they do it in a way that they prohibit certain contents to appear on, uh, on mobile. So, you know, as I mentioned to you, Firefox is not allowed to run on iOS. Apple prohibits any other browser that is not Safari. Uh, because they, by the rules they have on their application store, they don't allow you to publish a browser that has its own rendering engine. The same does Windows uh, with Microsoft. Microsoft prohibits other browsers to run um, on Windows Phone. But it's even worse than just the browser, which you might think, well, if I, I'm using apps, I don't care what browser I have. But with the apps, you also have a lot of problems. You know the story about Flash and how Apple decided to block Flash <coughs> in, uh, in iOS to the point that Adobe then decided to stop Flash, even though on the web is like 90% of the people are, are using Flash. But there's other interesting things, like um, Amazon um, is famous because he had a problem with Apple. Amazon is not allowed to sell books from the Kindle application. Uh, because Apple prohibits them because it competes with its own bookstore. So if you have a Kindle app on a, on a PC, you can then buy books directly from there. And when you're reading the book, it recommends you other books. And with a click, you can just go and download the book. If you have an iOS, you cannot do it. You can only read the books. If you want to buy a book in, uh, in iOS from Amazon, you have to go to the browser and then access the Amazon store from there, which is you know, it's very complicated because you have to switch up, you have to search um, many clicks, etc., etc. So people buy less books on Amazon, on iOS. So this is not a fair competitive situation. If you want people to do whatever they want, and uh, you know, we should have an open uh, ecosystem that doesn't allow these things from happening. So let's go back a little bit of history. Do you know who this guy is? OK, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, every time I ask a question, I will look at who is answering. And then we have some phones to give away later from our partners LG and Alcatel with Firefox OS. So I will then select the person that has contributed the most to the talk. So who is this guy? <laughs> you don't know? Tim Berners-Lee. He's got a point now. So <laughs> yes, this is Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is, uh, is a person from England. Uh, he's actually been in Campus Party many times uh, in different parts of the world. And, um, uh, and he invented the web. He invented the World Wide Web. Why? This is, this is what the document he created. He was working in an institution called CERN. Uh, which is a physics uh, institute in, uh, in Geneva, and he invented, he came up with this idea that content should be basically uh, connected to each other and you should be able to be in a piece of content and then link, click there and go somewhere else. And this is the principle of the World Wide Web and he invented HTML and he invented all the 
you know, the hyperlinking, the URLs, and all the uh, infrastructure that, uh, you know, today we know as the web. And this, this was a very relevant thing because uh, before people were accessing the internet using very different proprietary protocols. So you might be, for instance, inside American online internet, and you will not have access to someone else that was in, uh, in uh, InfoServe from some other you know, dial-up system that was disconnected from the other. So this basically connected everything with a common standard, the web, and through a common platform, which was the browser. So how many people remember this browser? OK, old guys, <laughs> because this is very old already. This is the first browser. This is the Mosaic, it's called. It was actually done in a university as a project. It uh, was done by a person called Mark Andreessen. Uh, which today is one of the most famous venture capitalists in the, in the industry. And he this, they developed this browser to implement basically the vision of Tim Berners-Lee of accessing the web. So, so the browser will basically render HTML content, will have URLs, will have hyperlinks, and, and everything you know today was, uh, was done back then. Okay, this is 2000, uh, a screenshot from 2004. This is very old one. So the first um, one, uh, when Netscape, um, so Mosaic was the first browser, but it was a non-commercial one. It appeared at the university. And then uh, at some point in time, Mark Andreessen with Jim Clark decided to create a corporation called Netscape that basically uh, developed a commercial browser. This is the first uh, commercial browser, Netscape. I'm sure most of you have never used it. Uh, how many people use Netscape in the past? Very, you probably 35 or 40 or above, because this has already disappeared. And this was the first commercial browser. It was also the, the beginning of the internet, as we know it today. They, they went public, they did an IPO, and went to the stock market uh, in 1994. And that was kind of what everyone considers the moment that the web became mainstream and started appearing many, many, many companies. They also did a lot of things. They created a, a technology called Java. They created a technology called JavaScript uh, at Netscape, which has nothing to do with Java except the name. You know, JavaScript is a scripting language uh, for the web. was created by Brendan H. when he was at Netscape. Brendan H. then is the founder of, uh, of Mozilla. We'll tell you more about this, uh, this later. And um, something happened in 1995. Um, and this happened in 1995. Do you know who is the guy in the shadow? No points. Too many people know this guy. So. <laughs> So yes, this is Bill Gates. Bill Gates in 1995 released Windows 95, uh, which was like the first um, uh, operating system that included a browser, Internet Explorer. And basically, what Microsoft noticed was that Microsoft had a monopoly for operating systems. And this was very good, because if you wanted to do something, you have to develop for Windows. And if you had to develop for Windows, means Microsoft will keep selling copies of Windows, because Windows will be more valuable, and people will want to use Windows. But when the web came, they saw the problem with an open ecosystem. Because if the ecosystem is completely open, then it doesn't matter whether you have Windows or not, because you have the web. So all the content will be available from any platform, and people could write browsers from any, any operating system. So what they did was release Windows 95, come up with this uh, browser, Internet Explorer. Um, this is the, one of the first versions of Internet Explorer. And basically, what they started doing was the following. They started taking market share from Netscape. So the way they did it, so this is, this is the Netscape market share in 94. It has 100%, obviously. It was the only browser available. And then when, uh, um, sorry, Netscape is here. So it started getting uh, market share. And then Microsoft started appearing and started getting and getting and getting market share. And why this happened? This happened because Microsoft bundled um, Internet Explorer with Windows, and Windows was the predominant operating system. So similar situation we have today in mobile. So they started making it complicated for other browsers to be on Windows. So people will start using Internet Explorer as default. They also did something like this. They started putting proprietary things in, in Internet Explorer. So websites only work if you're designing a website for Internet Explorer, not for the web. They started breaking all the standards. So people will have to use Internet Explorer and will have to develop for Internet Explorer. And they were very successful because they basically, by 2002, they had killed Netscape. So American Online then came. Uh, sorry, American Online then came, acquired Netscape, and then uh, Netscape basically disappeared uh, as we know it today. So the company disappeared. But then something very interesting happened. Uh, I don't know, have you guys seen the Jobs movie uh, recently? No, you haven't seen it? It's, uh, it's quite interesting because it explains the story of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was up at Apple, and then at some point in time he had problems, uh, so he left uh, Apple. But then Apple ran into problems, so they acquired a Steve Jobs company, and Steve Jobs came back to Apple. So when he came back to Apple, the first thing he did was basically to create a browser. Because he saw that by having the only Internet Explorer, which was available in, in Mac and, and PC, Microsoft will control the access to, to content. So 
he came back and created the browser Safari. This is the first new browser that appeared after Netscape disappeared and Internet Explorer to, to call the market share. So Safari came up in 2003. It was a big thing. He announced it as so, something important, not just for Apple, but for the industry. The other very important thing that uh, Steve Jobs did back then was took the core of Safari, which is called WebKit, and make it open source. So people could actually use that in other browsers. So many other browsers started to appear. But then something else happened. Uh, as I told you, Netscape uh, disappeared. Uh, the company basically was acquired by American Online. And American Online, after it saw that it lost all the market share, shut down Netscape. <laughs> and then some of the people that used to work at Netscape, they wanted to carry on with the idea of building a browser for the open web. So they asked American Online permission to leave the company and created the Mozilla Foundation. This is a nonprofit foundation whose mission is to protect the open web because the guys saw that they were destroyed by Microsoft and by Bill Gates and that the web became closed and became proprietary and they wanted to make it open again. So in 2004, they did this. They released Firefox. And they released Firefox as the first op truly open source browser that ever existed. So some of the founders are Mitchell Baker, which is the chairman, uh, chairwoman of uh, um, Mozilla today, and Brendan H, which is the CTO, who is the person that invented JavaScript. This, these guys are still there. They still work for the company, and they still fight for their mission of keep the, the web open. They did something very interesting. So they had actually uh, announcements on newspapers. This, this is 2004, so um, not everyone used 100% the web. So newspapers are still is something people read uh, back then. And they had things here saying that they were tired, that the Internet Explorer was crashing all the time, that it was not working well, that it was not innovating, that it was not advancing, which, of course, is not something Microsoft wanted to do, right? Because if you're Microsoft, what will you do? The web, you don't make any money. Windows, you make money. So you will protect Windows, and you will protect your core business, so you will not make the web something that uh, is good, uh, has a good user experience and advances. So Firefox came, and then another relevant thing happened. Google decided to create a browser. At this time, Google started to be a very large company and very powerful on the internet. So in 2008, they created Chrome as an alternative browser. And I'm going to show you something most people uh, don't remember. Have you ever read this comic book that Google released? One point there uh, for the fonts later. So this is a, a comic book that Google uh, published when they released uh, Chrome. Uh, and the comic book is actually very interesting to read. It says things that you know, browsers need to be stable because browsers are how people access content on the internet. They need to be secure. They need to be fast. They need to be simple and used. They need to be open source. They were saying all the things that Internet Explorer was not there. And they basically wanted to, to create their own browser to do it. So they did um, uh, Chrome. And you know, look at what happened. Remember the other graph, how Microsoft Internet Explorer grew? Look at what happened now. Firefox came, Chrome came, Safari came. They started taking market share from, from uh, Internet Explorer. So Internet Explorer is not relevant anymore today. In, in the actual numbers, this is only until 2012. If you look at the numbers now, it's less than 30%. Microsoft has sort of given up. They assume that people will install other browsers in Windows, not in Windows Phone, though. Uh, so we'll get there in a minute. And the web now is open. And why the, that the web became open again was important for the following. Because when you move from one browser to multiple browsers, there's competition. And competition and openness is a good thing because people try to compete and improve to, to create a better product. And then innovation advances very, very fast because there's many people trying to make their product better. Something that before, when there was only one browser, Microsoft was not doing. <coughs> so this is what facilitated this, the, the web ecosystem. Many of the inventions in the web today that you know that these companies uh, have used, like uh, Ajax, like the fact that you can type in the browser box and you will get the results immediately as you're typing, uh, all the interactivity, all the 3D games, and many, many, many of the things in the web were created precisely because of competition. Because one browser will implement it, and then another browser will copy it, and then everyone will put it, and then someone else will embed something else. And then for 10 years, we had a really good uh, you know, track record of innovation on the web that could make all these companies uh, you know, innovate as well. Because they had a platform that was open, that was accessible to everyone, and that had a lot of rich features to develop uh, applications and services. So let's go back to this. Do you think the web uh, is dead? Uh, well, we, the jury is still out there. But basically, what I want to tell you is this graph is the reason why uh, they are saying the web is dead. In fact, if you look at web traffic, this is the web traffic, how it looks like. So if you put the absolute number. So the web is actually growing. It's still growing. It's just as an absolute number, it's not growing. But it's still growing uh, as an, an absolute number. So 
Um, and not everyone agrees with the, with the web is dead. Let's go back to mobile and the situation on, on mobile that I mentioned today. This is uh, 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 Mark Piglin. Uh, Mark Piglin is very famous because one of the main Python uh, developers. He had a very famous Python, Python book. He's also famous because he disappeared at some point from internet. He decided to close down everything, his Twitter account, his blog, and everything. And uh, he's reappeared recently to work for, for Google. So he basically said something, a sentence that I really like. It says, the web is where you can build Google without asking anybody's permission, or Facebook, or the Pirate Bay. Enjoy your apps, suckers. Because this, this is the beauty of the web. In the web, you don't have to ask permission to anyone to publish your content and to develop anything. This is completely free and completely open, not like the apps uh, that uh, we're using today on mobile. So in Telefonica, we were seeing this in 2010 as a problem because we are basically giving uh, communication services uh, to, to our customers. We're also uh, you know, giving you devices. And we saw that people wanted one device instead of the other, but they could not switch devices because they, they had all their apps locked into one ecosystem. So we started thinking, like, what do we need to do to change the, the situation on mobile? We say, if mobile was like the web, then these problems disappear, right? Because you will publish anything. You will use anything. I don't care which. Uh, phone you buy, just buy whatever you like it, whatever is the cheapest for you, whatever is the, has the, the, the best hardware, like you do with a PC, and then you will use those applications from the browser. <laughs> and unfortunately, as I said to you, this is not the situation today. So um, while we were thinking this, we look at why the web on mobile is not working well. So there's a number of reasons. One is um, the web on mobile is not truly cross-platform. So iOS implemented in one way, Android a different way, Windows Phone now a different way. So the, the beauty of the web is that it's cross-platform. Um, the web on mobile has some performance issues, basically because companies on, on mobile, they're not interested in, in optimizing for the web. You don't have uh, good APIs on, on, uh, on mobile. So if you have um, uh, a mobile phone, you have a lot of things that, uh, you know, you have a lot of things on the, mo on the mobile phone that you need to access from a website. You need to access the accelerometer, the GPS, the camera. You know, for a long time, the Safari browser on, on iPhone could not access the camera. So if you wanted to upload a picture to Facebook, you couldn't do it from, uh, from the Safari. You had to go to an app, because that was the only way to do it. Apple blocks the API of the camera from the browser. And there is no technical reason. It's just something. It's a business decision to protect their, their ecosystem. You also need to provide some sort of discovery and monetization mechanism like you have with the Apple stores because developers, at the end of the day, uh, they want to, to make money. So, so we started looking at what we needed to do to fix these things. And then there's a technology called HTML5 that basically fixes a lot of these problems. Not the business problems, but all the technical problems. So HTML5 has uh, it's, it's not just one technology, but it's a collection of many, many, many different technologies. This is not a technical talk, so I'm not going to explain you what HTML5 is, even though there's many uh, places here that you can see it. And then HTML5 basically gives you, uh, on mobile, native audio and video support, offline storage. So you need to be able to use the application when you don't have connectivity uh, on your mobile. So this is important. Uh, it doesn't consume that much battery, which in a PC is not a problem because it's always plugged. But on mobile, suddenly, this is a big problem. It has a lot of transitions, animations, transformations, etc. using CSS, which is a web standard and has been greatly improved for HTML5. It has 3D graphics through WebGL, has device APIs, has something called WebRTC for providing real-time communications like chat, messaging, uh, video call, etc., etc., which on mobile people uh, do a lot. And it has something called Canvas that can actually read and convert pixels that allows people to freely you know, design things uh, on the web on mobile. So this is basically a collection of technologies that solves many of the technical problems that the web has on mobile that didn't have on PC. So you're going to skip this. And the other interesting thing is um, the, the developers like the web. Uh, the web developers is the largest community in the world. How, how many of you are developers here? OK. How many of you are web developers? You see the majority. How many are iOS developers? One, two, three, four. <laughs> So four, four guys raised their hand when I asked for iOS developers. When I asked for web developers, I lost the count, but it's maybe like 40 or 50 people here. So the web is where the developers are. So if we uh, uh, allow the web on mobile, we also will make it cheaper to develop for, for mobile. So it's actually a great thing. And every time we ask developers what they want, they always say that the web on mobile is what they want to do, because there's more people that knows how to program for the web. So this is a good example of a company. The Financial Times is a very famous uh, newspaper. <coughs> in um, sorry, in uh, in England, that basically had problems with uh, with Apple because Apple wanted to charge 30% of the subscription fee. 
to their customers. And these guys said, no, I don't want to pay 30% fee to Apple out, uh, on the Apple Store. And moreover, um, Apple told them, I will charge 30% of your subscription fee, and I will keep the customer. So you will not even know who is actually reading the newspaper. So these guys said, like, this is crazy. This is not how the, uh, the business should work. So they designed an app on HTML5. It's one of the best designed HTML5 apps that I, uh, if you go on an iPad, for instance, if you downloaded the app and you use this on the browser, you will see it's almost impossible to tell the difference. So these guys basically prove that you can do HTML5 apps that look like native uh, apps. There is no technology problem if you, if you know how to do it. So we started looking at what do we do to improve HTML5 further and to uh, you know, make it more useful, useful so people will use the web on mobile. And then we created a project called Open Web Device. So the name, original name was Open Web Device. This was a Telefonica project. We put a website and say, we want to create devices that uh, you know, use the open web. The open web as the primary way of accessing content, because this is how people should access content, because it's free, it's open, it's interoperable. Uh, anyone can do whatever business model they want. You don't depend on, on one ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. And then as, as we were publishing this, Something interesting happened. In the other side of the world, we're based in Madrid, in Spain. These guys were in California. Mozilla basically posted uh, in their website uh, a blog, uh, a blog post uh, called Buttugeco that basically said, you know, we are Mozilla Foundation. We want the web to be open. The web in PC is open thanks to Mozilla. Now, why mobile, the web is not open? We should make the web open and mobile as well, right? Because this will bring a lot of benefits to everyone. Uh, consumers, developers, content uh, producers, etc., etc. So when we saw this, we were like, wow, these guys are thinking exactly the same thing. So we basically sent them an email. And this is the, the actual email that one person from my team sent to Mozilla. Okay, so this was August 3, 2011, telling them, guys, you know, uh, we've been working in something called uh, open uh, web technologies, open web device, which is very similar to the boot to gecko idea. And we basically want to collaborate. You guys are Mozilla, open source uh, foundation, so why not good to collaborate? So we got the teams together and we started designing engineers with engineers a true uh, web based uh, operating system. So initially, it was a very small team. Uh, we went to uh, Mobile World Congress, which is this big mobile uh, uh, conference in Barcelona in 2012, in February. I was there with Brendan H. And we basically presented this idea of creating something called open web devices. So we thought that these devices, if they were only HTML5 and they were only web, will be truly open, will be the first open web devices that in the market compared to any of the other devices. So why this is important? Well, as I said, you know, uh, these phones run everything as a web application. So even things like the dialer you use to make a phone call, the SMS application, the contacts, everything is, is built on HTML5. Everything is a web application. There is no uh, proprietary technology. This is also um, devices where HTML5 runs the fastest and that has no performance issues. So we wanted to disprove uh, the idea that uh, HTML5 has performance issues. And it's truly open. Anyone can do, anyone can participate. We contribute with uh, open source code. And now almost 25% of the code is contributed by, by different partners. So we also implemented all hardware access. Anything in the hardware, you can access it from a web API using JavaScript. Everything is completely open. So there's no limit for what you can do on the device uh, using the web. But then people were telling us, how are you going to compete? Because this is, you know, as big players there is, is iOS, is Android. How are you going to compete with a, a new operating system based uh, on the open web? Uh, and we said, well, if you think about it, at the beginning of the presentation, I told you that you know, penetration of uh, smartphones in Korea is 80%. But Korea is just one country, right? It's not the world. If you look at different parts of the world, you know, people are more concerned about cost uh, than in places like Korea. So if you have something that is affordable, has a very good experience, and is completely open, people will want to buy it. But which countries are those? Well, basically, these are countries where you know, penetration of internet is still low, like in Latin America. In Latin America, penetration of, smart, uh, of internet is still low. And penetration of uh, smartphones is still low, it's 17%. So those people are using feature phones. And the reason not everyone can afford to pay an iPhone uh, in, in countries like Brazil, like Chile, in Colombia, in Peru, in Ecuador, etc., etc., And the same in other countries, like in Africa, in Asia, etc., etc. So even though it seems that everyone has a smartphone, in reality, in those countries, the penetration of smartphones in emerging countries is very small. So there's an opportunity to do something for these people that will give you a good, good experience, is open, is free, and it's uh, and, and cheap. The device is actually cheap. So 
uh, we thought that there was an opportunity for being the leaders with this operating system in, in the markets. And we basically did this. We created something called Firefox OS. So this is the official name that we announced in July 2012. Um, this is the official logo. It's the Fox the, from Firefox, but with movement, because this is mobile. It's, it's the mobile uh, operating system. And then, since then, we launched here in Brazil one year ago. Uh, this is uh, uh, Valente, is the president of Telefonica Brasil. He showed the first developer device that ran on Firefox OS, a Gigs phone. Anyone remember this from last year? Anyone was here last year when we saw this? So we basically started giving uh, talks here in Campus Party one year ago about how to construct uh, you know, Firefox OS apps. We gave, I think, around 800 devices to, uh, to lots of different people here. These are uh, developer devices, not commercial devices, so the developers could actually take uh, uh, one device in their hands and try it. And in July 2013, July last year, we launched the first commercial device of Firefox OS in Spain. This is Mitchell Baker. She's the HR woman of, uh, from the, uh, of Mozilla. She's, he's the CEO of, uh, of Mozilla J, uh, so, and this is me, as you can see. And this is a, a device. It was called the, the ZTE Open. It was made by a Chinese company called ZTE. This is very nice. As you can see, the, the whole branding and everything is, uh, is based on, uh, on Mozilla images. Uh, this device in Spain only costs 40 euros. It's the cheapest smartphone in the market. It's by far the cheapest. There's no way to find something. But the user experience is very good. It's open. The web, all the websites work well. There's lots of web apps. I'll tell you in a minute about this. So we basically <coughs> created what we wanted something that is affordable, but it has a very good user experience to promote the smartphones. <coughs> so this is some images of the launch we did in Spain with all the images of uh, Firefox. And then here in uh, Futurecom, we launched the first devices in Brazil. This was in October uh, this year. We launched two devices, LG and Alcatel. We have our partners from LG and Alcatel there that are going to give um, two giveaways later at the end. <coughs> so this is uh, the official launch here. Uh, in Brazil, the Vivo from Firefox OS. This is some of the, you know, um, some of the advertisements we had here uh, in uh, in uh, Spain and in uh, in Brazil with uh, Firefox OS. And in 2013, this has been a great success for Firefox OS. As you can see, we've launched in 14 different countries, not just Telefonica, but four other operators. So, this is the first new smartphone OS that has actually done something. So there's a lot of people talking about things like Ubuntu, Tyson, Selfish, etc., etc. but no one has actually launched uh, real devices. Firefox OS has launched four, uh, three different devices from three different brands, LG, Alcatel, and ZTE, in 14 different countries with four uh, operators. So this is the first credible alternative to the duopoly that we have with iOS and, uh, and Android. These are the devices. Uh, this is the Alcatel and the LG. These are the, one, the two ones that we will give in away at the end. Uh, this is the ZTE, which is the one we, we launched uh, in Spain. And we have now devices coming from Huawei and from Sony as well. So in 2014, uh, you will see many, uh, many more uh, new devices appearing from Firefox OS. So Firefox has also something interesting, which is a marketplace. So uh, one thing uh, is that you can install anything you want in Firefox OS. You can upload anything you want to the marketplace. But the marketplace also see, uh, is a way to you know, curate the content to make sure the content in the marketplace doesn't have any spam or any virus or any, any problem with it. So as I said, this is an open ecosystem. Anyone can create a marketplace, but Mozilla has choose to create one. And this is important because this is where people go to get content. And there is lots of content already. All the major internet companies, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, YouTube from Google, things like Line, uh, Cut the Rope with games, etc., etc., have produced web apps for Firefox OS. These are web apps that use only HTML5, so it's, all <coughs> it's similar to what you could run in another uh, device that run, has HTML5, so it's not proprietary for Firefox OS. I don't know if I'm going to last until the end of the, of the talk. Good. So this is a little bit of the of the sales of Firefox OS. Um, we, uh, we're not allowed to put num actual numbers, but as you can see, in the countries where we launched first, this has been growing very nicely. Then Brazil and Uruguay, Peru, Mexico, these are countries we launched later, so it's still, uh, still growing. But the, the good news is that in some of the countries of Telefonica, the Firefox OS devices are more than 10% of the new devices. So we basically have managed to create the web as the platform for the third um, ecosystem. And even in some countries, we have 35% of devices are Firefox OS. So this has been a big success, and this proves that basically these devices is what people, <coughs> what people want. If you give them a, a device based on the web, open, and with a good experience and good price, people will buy it. 
This is another interesting thing I wanted to mention. Since we launched Firefox OS together with Mozilla, we've been tracking all everything that people have said about Firefox OS on Twitter, on Facebook, on websites, etc., etc. And this is an amazing uh, chart because it says 47% are slightly favorable, but they are favorable towards Firefox OS. 45% are strongly favorable, and there is only 2% that are slightly unfavorable, and 0.5% that is strongly unfavorable. So basically, people get it. People understand the importance of the open web. They understand why in the past, you know, people like Mozilla and then uh, Apple and Google, you know, uh, eliminated the monopoly that uh, Microsoft had, and that created a lot of more innovation around. And what we have today in mobile, even though you think you have everything you need on mobile, that's not true. If mobile was open, you will have 10 times more things and much more innovation and much more facility for people to develop, to publish applications, to create different business models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people get it. Look at this. This is amazing. There's no other brand in the market that has so, so much public opinion in favor of it. And I know Brazil is a big country of this because you guys get open source and you understand the value of, uh, of open source. Good. So we're expanding partner support. We have 18 more uh, global operators that are coming on board and are going to release Firefox OS devices. We have, uh, as I said, five device manufacturers. And then the interesting thing is that everyone is contributing not to distribute devices, but also with engineering support. This is an open source project. If you want to collaborate with Android, it's impossible. Android is not open source. Android has a completely closed governance. Only Google can participate. Only Google tells what goes into Android. This is different here. This is a true open source project, completely open to anyone. If you're a developer and you want to participate, you have uh, here lots of resources, lots of places where you can go, you can help. You can do testing, you can do localization, translation, et cetera, et cetera. And more than 25% of Firefox OS is developed outside Mozilla. This is very, very important because it keeps the, the ecosystem open. So um, this is a little bit of the countries where we're going to launch, as you see. Firefox OS soon is going to be in almost 80% of the world. So this is great news. And why this is uh, important? Because if you think how long it took to Android to do this, we're doing this in one third of the time. So most people don't know, but Android was founded in 2003. 2003, so keep in mind, it's, almost, uh, it's more than 10 years ago. Google acquired Android in 2005. I don't know if you knew that Google actually didn't develop Android. They acquired a company called, called Android and had the operating system. The, the, the devices were announced in 2007, but they were only launched in 2008. And since then, to get to version 3.2, which is the most, the majority of the versions that are installed of Android in low-end devices are up to version 3.2, it took them almost uh, 10 years. Okay? It took them nine years. With Mozilla, and thanks to the partner support and thanks to so many people contributing from the community, we've managed to launch starting in July 2011. This is when the project started, only Mozilla and Telefonica. And then we've launched in, 2000, in July 2014, which is two years after. So the, the, we're going to have a release that has feature parity with Android. You won't have the same features that Android uh, up to version 3.2 has, which is amazing. So in two years, we've done what Google uh, took nine years. And why we've managed to do it so quickly? because the community has helped, because this is open and people have contributed. There's a lot of open source things that go there that we don't need to, to develop again. So this is a proof of why open source is so powerful. And even though people think that a you know, small company like, uh, like Mozilla is never going to be able to compete, but the only way to compete is by doing it with the community, with people like all these web developers that, uh, that are here. Good. As I said, these are resources uh, where you can go and, uh, and uh, help or find information for if you are a developer and you want to develop applications. Uh, we'll be running uh, things here, running Campus Party, and, uh, and I encourage you to try it because if you're a web developer, you'll be amazed how simple it's for you to, the, to do a web app compared to if you try to do something in iOS or, or with Java and in Android. Good. So I think that this is uh, the, the, the real important thing of Firefox OS is not Firefox OS per se. It's the more open web. This is not about Firefox OS conquering the world. This is about doing the same thing Mozilla did in, in, the, in the browser space. It's about creating competition. It's about creating more people and everyone supporting the open web. Because the more competition is in the open web, the faster the open web uh, will advance and the more innovation uh, people will do. So we, we hope that this will basically you know, create a world that is open and not a world that is closed based on proprietary platforms and on e companies' interests that are, uh, you know, taking decisions for, in, for you instead of you being able to take any decision uh, you want. So hopefully we'll have one web and not like now that we have the web on the desktop and mobile, which is completely closed from the rest of the web, and this will make, uh, you know, the world a better place. Thank you very much.
do questions and then you... Okay, uh, we still have like uh, five minutes to do questions and then we'll give you the, the devices. So, as I said, the ones that participate the most will get the devices. So, question please. Yeah? That's okay. I just need a microphone so people... Any question? Você acha que com a plataforma aberta in, in English? Você acha que com a internet livre é, a, os aplicativos mobiles. No, 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 I'm gonna ask again. I can't hear it from here. Você acha que com a internet livre, os aplicativos mobile, eles vão demorar muito para migrar totalmente para a web e começar desenvolvimento mesmo só na web em vez de ser é, jogar na Apple Store ou no Google Android. Mas lá. Okay. Você que So, if I understand the question correctly, she help me with this. You're asking what what do I think it will happen with the apps on mobile? I think what what will happen is for some time, we will continue seeing apps on mobile because Apple and, and Google are going to do everything they can to make sure the best way to develop is apps. And there's nothing we can do about it. The only thing we can do is to make sure people also see the value of developing for the web. And one interesting thing that is happening is that a lot of the apps on mobile for Apple, for iOS and for Android are actually based on HTML5. So if people start using HTML5, even if then you have to compile into a native app to publish on the on the App Store. I think this is still a good thing to uh, to do, and we're also encouraging this because eventually, as Firefox OS grows, I think Google at the end of the day is a web company. So so we will see more. Google now has put Chrome on uh, on Android, which is a good thing because Chrome is a very advanced browser. So I think that as Firefox gets market share, Google goes back to their origin uh, being a web company. Apple loses market share. I don't know if you saw yesterday the news, but Apple revenue declined one percent for the first time in, I don't know, the last 10 years or something like that. So Apple uh, is going to run into problems eventually. It's impossible that they keep up uh, with the power they have. I think eventually we'll see developers migrating to the web. And this takes time. Uh, in the web, it took 10 years. So it's going to take maybe, I don't know, not 10 years now, because we already have uh, several years of work, but another three to five years. Uh. One of the things that we like on Android and iPhone is the monetizing. Yeah, it's easy because of the app Very stores good. and all that stuff. They get 30%, but they give a whole ecosystem that is good for our, for us developers. It's ready, it's all set, you just receive the money. How will Firefox OS is suggesting this, this monetizing part? So it's, it's doing it um, in a similar way. So Firefox OS in many of the countries where it's being launched, it has a payment API for the web. So you can basically pay from a web app the same way that you can pay uh, on the App Store. The, the good ne of course, the ecosystem is smaller, so, the, so the, the volume is not there yet. But on the other hand, there is no limitation on the revenue share. So you take whatever you want. You can publish it without going through the marketplace. So I think that even though it's smaller now, it's more flexible. And it has a payment API. There's a web API. Uh, called Payment API. In fact, a person called Fernando from my team wrote that API. And then from operators, what we're doing is also bringing uh, carrier billing uh, to the web API. So basically, a consumer will be able to pay for an app from a web app, and then it will show in your bill, which is actually a good thing for emerging markets, because in emerging markets, credit cards uh, doesn't have the penetration that they have in, uh, in other countries. So one of the main problems for Android it's actually the lack of credit cards on, on the Android store. And of course, there's advertising, whatever else you want to do, is, is up to you. So there's no limitation. So I think that uh, the, the ecosystem in that respect will have a monetization mechanisms as well, because we understand that developers want to make money. You said during the during the palestra that the applications for Android and iOS are all very closed. A proposta do Firefox de fazer a, a web aberta, no caso, os aplicativos que saírem para o Firefox OS, eles serão open, open source também? Não. 
This is, an, you don't need to do it open source, so this is up to you. So it's the same as in the web, right? The web is open, it means you have to use open standards and from one website, you need to be able to link to another website, et cetera, et cetera. But the source code of the websites is not open. This is depends on the, on the developer. So this is your decision. You think it's, is, if it's a good idea, you, everyone start using Mozilla Firefox? I didn't, I didn't hear. Can, can you put this closer? Do you think it's a good idea if everyone starts Mozilla Firefox? If everyone starts using it? Huh? You, you, you're asking me if I think it's a good idea that everyone uses Firefox? Because, of course. Because uh, you say... <laughs> I've been spending an hour explaining this. <laughs> because you say it's, if it's just one uh, empresa. O que você disse, se fosse apenas uma empresa, acabaria com a liberdade. Ah, você está dizendo que se todo mundo usa Firefox, Firefox se torna um monopólio. Ok, ok. Não, não, não. Então, há uma diferença. Primeiro, Mozilla é uma fundação de não Então, não é uma corporação que está procurando profitar. Isso é muito diferente. Porque mesmo se Mozilla, não sei, ganha 90% de market share, o que é bem unlikely, porque, no final do dia, você sabe, haverá algumas pessoas que querem iPhone ou or, or Android. The, the, the good thing is that Mozilla is not driven by money. It's driven by making the web open. So uh, as a foundation, they will keep that. So I, I, if I have to choose between 90% Android and 90% Mozilla, I'll go for 90% Mozilla because Mozilla is, is a non-profit. Android, at the end of the day, is owned by Google. And it doesn't matter what Google says, they don't want to do evil. You know that's not true, right? They want to make money because they have shareholders and they are publicly traded and that's what they need to do. Otherwise, the, the CEO will get uh, fired. So, and the other beauty of, uh, of uh, Firefox OS is that anyone can contribute. So if for whatever reason Mozilla decides to do something that the community thinks is not the right direction, the community can get around the product, the project, and can go on and start building uh, something else. And the, open, the, the source code of Firefox OS is 100% open source. Android is not open source. Android only open sources a part of the operating system. And they only do it after they've done the release. So there's no way to know the roadmap. And there's no way to get 100% of an Android open source. So if you try to build a phone using Android open source, it's impossible. Because you don't have the marketplace. You don't have the browser. You don't have the, the email client. You don't have the calendar. You don't have a lot of the applications. In, in Firefox OS, everything is open. So I think that that should not be a problem if 100% of people use Firefox OS. Bom dia. A gente sabe que o, a maioria dos celulares das grandes companhias que são expressivas no mercado hoje, elas têm aquele estigma causado pelo NSA dos Estados Unidos e da quebra da privacidade das informações dos usuários, tanto por qualquer forma de comunicação ou de, por geolocalização. Como que o mobile da Mozilla, Firefox, vai atuar no mercado com a proteção de informações? Yeah. Do, Informações pessoais dos usuários. That's, that's a very good question. So he asked about privacy and, and personal information. How are we going to guarantee <coughs> that American, you know, NSA or large American corporations don't, don't collect the information that happens on the mobile phone? So uh, first, um, as I said, 100%, if you want to collect information from a website, you need to put some software that collects the information, right? This is what the NSA uh, has been doing in the US. Mozilla has published a way for people, and, and Mozilla is, is in the US. If the government comes and tells Mozilla, you need to put this line of code to send me a copy of everything that happens, by law they have to do it. Now, what they've done is very interesting because Firefox OS is 100% open source. You can actually check that the build of Firefox OS and the Firefox browser is the same. It's exactly the same you will get with 100% open source, which you can check whether there is a line that sends information to the American government. So it's the only company that you can actually verify whether they're doing that or not, because you can compare. In Android, you don't know, because Android is not op is no longer open source. So maybe you know, there's something on Android that sends information to the American government, and, and uh, there's no way for you to verify. But on Firefox, both the browser and the mobile OS, you can verify it. So, so I think that's the main difference. And Mozilla is the, is the number one company in terms of uh, privacy and security in the world. So I think that's a good thing for for this operating system. <coughs> okay, so, all right, can you guys, you guys wanna come up? 
Okay. Now we're giving, uh, we have to give the, the two devices. I don't know who to choose because all of you make really good questions. So <laughs> I'm going to ask them how they want to do it. Hi. How do you want to choose? Who? Sorry, just speak English. You don't speak English? No. no. ¿Cómo vais a escoger? ¿Cómo vais a escoger a quién se lo damos? Okay. <laughs> um, so they tell me that I, I need to choose the two best questions uh, and two best answers. So um, this is a very uh, big problem because maybe you will think I have a, a bias. But I think the, the two best questions, I think the ones that I think more relevant were the one about privacy and security and the one about monopoly. So guys, please come up and you have one phone for each of you. Any preference? I'll give you this and this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Come, come. We're going to take a picture. Obrigado. Thanks, everyone.